Hello, everyone. Could I have your attention, please? We're about to get started. If you could please take this time and please turn off your electronic devices so we have no interruptions to our discussion. And a reminder that this roundtable discussion will be on the record and it will be streamed live on the council's website and on the council's YouTube channel. Thank you. Well, good morning. Welcome to the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, also known as Ice Station Zebra. <laughs> Thanks for coming through the cold for a conversation on national security and reform. And we're honored to have Congressman Mac Thornberry with us. Your timing is great. I mean, the president has submitted his budget proposal to Congress. He's also submitted an authorization for the use of military force to Congress. And so we have with us arguably uh, the most authoritative voice in Congress on both issues. So I think you'll enjoy hearing the chairman's remarks on both of these big public policy questions. Uh, he has a distinguished career, as you know. I mean, we're lucky actually to have him in this job since not only is the uh, chairman of the HASC, as it's known inside the Beltway, but he also served on the Intelligence Committee uh, and on the Budget Committee, which is an important part of this puzzle. And in fact, the congressman agreed to, in, in his conversation this morning, to enlighten us a bit on this complicated budgetary process that he has to manage, as well as the actual numbers uh, themselves. So my name is Jim Shin, and my marching orders this morning is, are to engage the congressman in a couple of questions for about 30 minutes and then turn to the members for, for your questions and comments. And I could tell since they sent me the list of attendees last night that you have drawn a particularly knowledgeable uh, and, and well-informed group and I think you'll enjoy uh, the dialogue. So, um, I thought maybe we would we would ask your views in two general areas, uh, both of which your committee has has considerable purview over. The first is the big question of of um, arming, equipping, and training the armed forces themselves. Right. I mean, that's the principle the principal but not the sole responsibility of oversight for your committee. And the second question is, is your views on the use of force, both for deterrence and for the actual conduct of, of combat operations. And again, uh, uh, Congressman Thornberry's committee and he personally have, have a considerable role in shaping that on, on both counts. So maybe the first, the first question would be in terms of the, the budget itself. What what do you make of this $580 billion submission, particularly given the budget caps, which are still in effect? Um, it, it's, it's complex, and, and, and actually the next two weeks, I think, are going to be very important for, for us in the House in sorting through how we <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> try to have enough uh, budgetary resources for our military and still still deal with the Budget Control Act and its aftermath. And, and I, y'all probably don't want to go back through the whole history of this, but, but just briefly, if you'll remember, in 2011, Congress passed, the President signed this thing called the Budget Control Act, which reduced spending a certain amount and then it set up a super committee to try to reform entitlements to reduce spending another amount. And as a forcing function, if though there was not some sort of mandatory spending or entitlement reform, there would be these automatic cuts to the uh, discretionary side of the budget, half from defense, half from non-defense spending. So the super committee failed. 
and uh, defense spending in real terms has been cut 21 percent since 2010. So that's what's happened. Uh, now the two-thirds of the budget that is mandatory spending has not been touched. The domestic discretionary has been cut, and defense, as I mentioned, has gone down 21 percent. So, but that's the current law. So unless you change that current law, the, cur the, the amount of money we have, and, and it's hard to compare apples and apples, if you look at the 050 budget account, the current uh, uh, spending for defense would be $523 billion, which is about flat with last year. And, and so unless we find a way to change the law, and that means get the president to sign something, we're going to be at, at that level uh, and all the military advisors say that is at least $40 billion too little. Uh, again, I, I won't go on too long about this, but uh, so some of my colleagues say, well, the military's gotten by okay the past couple years. We can continue to get by with it. Part of what's happened is they have deferred training. They have deferred maintenance. They have bought fewer things. So rather than buy 20 airplanes at the most efficient rate this year, we'll buy 15. Uh, and push off those purchases to future years, which means they're going to be more expensive, and we don't we don't get them as qu as quickly. So does this mean that 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 um, no matter what budget your, your committee um, comes out with, if they don't change the budget caps, then it automatically drops back down to yeah the magic number. I think it's four hundred and ninety nine yeah billion dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, that is true. Unless there is a new law signed, whatever we pass, it automatically goes back down to that lower level. And it's, and it's a multi-stage process. So you pass a budget resolution, then you have an authorization bill, which is separate, and then appropriation bills. So you can think you're doing something in the budget, but unless you work it all the way through the process, you're not going to actually have the increased number of bullets, guns, or whatever it is you're buying get to the, get to the troops. And, and, of course, we deal with this budget, and I know we'll talk about this in a second, in a world with more complex threats probably than we have ever faced, uh, at least as far as the testimony that we've gotten in the committee goes. So it's, it's a pretty scary time to continue to be drawing down on the capabilities that our country has available to us. So as I understand it, you have to manage both the, both the mathematics of the budget on the one hand, that complicated process, but you also have to manage this sort of analytical process of trying to figure out, well, how much is enough? And in fact, I, I was watching uh, a YouTube clip of hearings he held recently, and one of his members was complaining somewhat plaintively that, you know, this budget is just so big and it's so complicated that unless you're doing this for a long time, it's difficult to see if we, the committee, are actually providing oversight on whether the, whether the components of the budget and the size of the budget actually meet national security needs of this country in your judgment. And the way it was done conventionally was that you'd look at the, the, the QDR, right, the Quadrennial Defense Review that said, here are the big risks, and then you look at the budget and you'd compare the two, and the delta, the difference between those was how much national security risk you were taking if you made the budgetary choices that you made. How do you, how do you approach that process? I mean, how much risk, in your view, is, th is this country exposed to if we go forward and hit the budget caps and it drops back down to this blunt instrument of sequestration? Yeah, uh, a lot is, is, is the short answer. You know, we, you know if, if you looked at this logically, you would, fig you would look at the threats, you would develop a strategy, and then resource the strategy. I suspect that's what uh, uh, most people in business would try to do. We don't do that in the federal government. And, you know, it's a fair argument to say how much security is enough. It's kind of like how much health care is enough. Well, you know, it's hard to put a quantifiable limit on it. But, but we don't even, I think, make... A, a decent effort at calculating risk. Uh, more often in recent years, the Quadrennial Defense Review has been a slick, glossy publication that justifies how much money an administration wants to spend. 
And, and so then we get an outside group of experts, and th this year it was the National Defense Panel, who have former secretaries of defense, military folks who, who look at the threats and, and come up with an amount they think is appropriate. But, but uh, un unfortunately, we're pretty much l governed by what the political budget maneuverings are, and then our job is to try to make the best use of whatever figure comes out of that messy, non-strategic process, and, 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 and that's really the way it works. So the big, <clears throat> the big book that you get from the Pentagon is just the starting point, right? So you're, you and your committee um, get to weigh in systematically on the big decisions regarding force size, force structure, where they're deployed, what kind of weapon systems they use. And how much they're paid? What, what do you, in your view, what are the big, what are the really big decisions that your committee is going to have to make, particularly with regard to some of the defense reform hot buttons like military compensation, Tricare, even base closure? Um, if I can back up just one step, because because you're exactly right, the way it has traditionally worked is the president sends up a budget to Congress. We hold a hearing with the Secretary of Defense to explain the budget, and then we have the Secretary of the Army, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of the Air Force, all the combatant commanders come up and basically support the president's budget. Uh, we're not doing that this year. We're having at least two months of hearings basically on the threats, on the challenges that we face. And then we're going to have the Secretary of Defense at the end of that process come and explain to us how the President's budget proposal does or does not meet all of those threats that, or, and challenges that we've been hearing about for two months. So for the first time, at least in my 20 years, we are upending the process and trying to gain a better understanding of the strategic environment in which we operate uh, before we jump right in to the dollars and cents for this, that, and, and the other thing. Now it's unsettled the Pentagon a little bit. It's unsettled uh, the, the committee staff a little bit. But, but um, I think it, at least given all of the challenges we face, it, it makes some sense. Uh, among the, the, the big decisions we have are a commission uh, uh, a few weeks ago recommended changes in military retirement and benefits. Uh, so we've got to uh, uh, see what we're going to do with that in, in health care, just like everybody else, is a major component of that. Uh, we have a major reform effort uh, on acquisition, both the goods and services that uh, we're working with the Pentagon on. We're not going to fix it, but we're going to try to make some improvements and then keep, keep after it. Uh, if we're down at the sequester level, then uh, there are going to have to be some uh, programmatic decisions, weapon systems and other things that we just do not have the money to, to pay for. And, you know, I worry a little bit. The military says uh, that, we're, as I mentioned, sequester is about $40 billion lower than the lower ragged edge of what it takes to defend the country. So we're going to be down there at a level where there will be substantially increased risk. Uh, it's going to be hard to quantify it. It's going to be hard to say, okay, we have greater risk here and here uh, at the expense of this. It's, it, you know, when you're dealing with these things, it's, it's, it's hard to make it concrete. And yet we see every day from the, the lack of training, the lack of maintenance, the, 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 the things that have already happened under sequestration, it's having a real impact on our military. We, we, we are, the Pentagon is sending pink slips to majors and captains who have combat experience. Think of the investment the country has in these folks, but as we downsize, reduce the number of people, especially in the Army and Marine Corps, we're saying even if you want to stay, you can't stay, you got to go. Uh, and, and so it's, it, that's just sort of thing that, that is happening uh, that doesn't seem to me to be very smart. So this is, this is risk management of a particularly complicated kind. Yeah. Uh, most people in this room, yeah. I think, probably engage in some kind of risk management. But um, the consequences of failure aren't usually as, as, uh, as serious as they are for a national security risk failure. What do you see as the biggest risks posed 
by this by this by this delta? Um, I, I I think the challenge of the times we live in is that uh, at least since the end of World War II and maybe ever we have never faced this wide array of complex threats in a very volatile world that moves so quickly. So that's why it's so hard to pin down. Is it terrorism? Is it cyber attack? Is it Russia's aggression or the Chinese or, or the North Korean uh, uh, new systems or the Iranian missiles and nuclear program? Or is it some disease that, you know, Ebola intentionally induced uh, that, that spreads like wildfire? I, th I think it's, it's impossible to say. And, and so it, it re I, I realize many folks deal with risk management. I think this is more like gambling because uh, it, it's, it's more unpredictable. You don't know where the threat is, is going to be, and you're, taking a, you're gambling that uh, you'll have the right ca capability in the right place at the right time and be smart enough to use it. I think Wall Street risk management may at times be more like gambling than, than, uh, than we think. But but the but the process of trying to assess the risks is is the same. So you're gonna you're gonna broadcast these hearings. Sure. Oh, as the sure. sure. Yeah. And and we've already started. I, w for example, this week we've got a public hearing on what's happening in Ukraine and especially the Russian tactics, uh, unconventional tactics of taking people out of their uniforms, subversion of the government, and so forth. Because I I think while we most of us understand marching in uniform in formation across national borders. What Putin and some extent the Chinese and others are doing is a is are different forms of warfare that we are not as well suited to dealing with. So we've got that hearing this week. We also have a hearing on the authorization to use military force against ISIS. Let me let me ask you about <coughs> the AUMF. There's an acronym for everything I learned in the Pentagon. That's that's a big one. AUMF. But the, um, I mean, Ice Station Zebra actually, I imagine some people have seen, some of us are old enough to remember the Cold War. I have to remember, remind my students that there was a time when the Russians were, were, were not our allies. And that was filmed in 1968, right? But I bet if a year ago somebody had suggested to you that one of the biggest military threats was dealing with a Russian-backed insurgency somewhere in Eastern Europe, you probably would have thrown them back onto Indep Independence Avenue. What do, you, what do you make of this, of the President's proposal for the authorization of use of military force, which is really, as I understand it, focused on uh, ISIL, ISIL, ISIL rather than the Russians yeah, yeah, per right, se. Right, what, right. Why, insofar as you can infer a strategy on the part of uh, the West Wing, why this bill and why now? Uh, I'm not good at figuring out why they do things, um, uh, particularly the why now part. We've been bombing in Iraq and Syria since at least September, and we have been asking the president to submit to us a uh, language to authorize the use of military force there since then or before, and, and why now, I don't know. Um, but I, I guess my view is regardless of the reason, the Constitution puts on Congress the responsibility to declare war, and a lesser subset of that is authorize the use of military force. And I think we need to do our job uh, and, and, and grapple with this and, and vote on it. The second thing I feel very strongly about is when we send men and women out of the military out to do a mission, they need to know that the country backs them that they have the full protection under the Constitution for the missions that they engage, are engaged in, and that it's not just a president or an administration, but it's the country that has authorized and supports what they're doing. So uh, in addition to the constitutional argument, I think they deserve to have the Congress uh, uh, authorize the, the broad parameters of what they're sent to do, and then, of course, the president uh, is, as Commander-in-Chief tactically tells them uh, how to do that. I've got qualms about the language the President sent up. As you all may know, it, it includes a number of conditions. It does not authorize enduring offensive ground combat operations. I worry 
that we are asking our pilots or our people on the ground to have a lawyer by your side to figure out whether that's enduring or not, or it's offensive or not, or whether it's ground combat or not. Uh, and, and we are in this kind of ironic situation where I th and, and where many Republicans want to give the president broader authority, many Democrats want to give him, constrain him further, and, and so how is this going to come out? I don't know. Uh, that's part of the reason we have hearings and try to dig deeper and think about and understand these things. As I mentioned, the first one in our committee is, is, is this week, um, but I think it's important. Um, some of his critics have said that this is, this is likely to be another case where political tactics uh, bleed into strategic blunder. And the analogy that they draw is the president's attempt to, to square the circle and approve a surge into Afghanistan, but to impose a time limit, in effect telling the Taliban, if you hang on long enough, we're going to, we're going to retreat. Some say that in his attempt to, to um, square the circle between his base and the fact that the Republicans control the ha both houses, of uh, that he's setting himself up for another strategic bind, another strategic error some point down the road, and, and who knows how ISIL is going to turn out. Um, those who are even a bit more cynical uh, believe that, uh, the, that this is not going to go very well for quite a while, and the President is looking to share responsibility slash blame with the Congress so that uh, the, uh, he and, and his party are not forced to bear the full weight of the strategic blunder that has become has come in part from his premature withdrawal from Iraq and the lack of an effective strategy to, to counter ISIS. I, I don't know. What, what, what I do know is that I think this is the most sophisticated, best equipped, best trained uh, terrorist organization we faced. And my opinion is the momentum, they still have the momentum. It's still growing. Uh, and so it must be confronted. It, it is not up to us alone to confront them. As a matter of fact, we, it is important for Sunnis to be in the forefront of this. But I absolutely believe that the other nations in the region are not going to step up to the plate if they have doubts about whether we're right with them and behind them. Uh, and, and these doubts about the reliability of the United States as an ally uh, permeates th their decisions on, on what actions to take as well as the, the, the things involving Russia, China, and, and around the world. I mean, the tough question you'd want to ask, I suppose, would be, <clears throat> since you get both documents from the White House, is are the components and size of the defense budget that he just, he just gave you consistent with the outlines for the use of military force, particularly against ISIL. Another way of saying, will the military have the capability and the size required to exercise the force he's proposing to use in the region where he's proposing to use it? Yeah, I, I guess the key, though, phrase that you use there is the force he is proposing to use. And that gets back to, is there a strategy to really push back on, on these folks? Or is this uh, kind of a, uh, more of a contain as best we can for a while and, and hope that they collapse on themselves? Uh, I, mean, I mean, if you step back, if, in trying to understand the administration's approach, step one is to try to get the Iraqi military back on their feet so that there can be some effective force other than the Kurds to push back inside Iraq. Now to do that, you've got to get the Iraqi government to regain some of the trust of the Sunnis, uh, and, and we don't see much sign of that so far, and that's the easy part. You know, the harder part is how do you get a force inside Syria to push back? So we're about to start training uh, a small number of people, but even the military folks doing the training say that the goal here is over the next few years to enable them to be better able to defend themselves, not some sort of offensive action against, against ISIS.
Uh, so b back to your point, uh, I think that's right, ideally, but, but you've got to have some sort of idea what sort of forces, what sort of strategy you want to employ before you know whether it's resourced appropriately. And, and one of the questions I'm going to have in these hearings is, okay, you're asking us to authorize the use of military force. What is your strategy for success? Because I'm not sure we've heard it so far. Maybe one last question, then we'll turn to the, to the members. I mean, here's another, there's another puzzle here, which is, as you said, the, whether resources are commensurate with strategy. What do you make of the so-called Asia pivot? And do you see either an action so far by DOD or by statements of, of strategy that you've received from your various uh, testimonies from the Pentagon that, that the Asia pivot is real? Are there changes in force structure commensurate with that, or is this political rhetoric? Um, I don't see much evidence that it's real. Uh, if, if you're, when you pivot, you turn away from something towards something else. Uh, I don't know of anybody who disagrees with the basic point that East Asia is a, is a region of increasing importance to the world and it will continue to grow importance. Uh, but, but this idea that you turn away from something else, I think, basically was a, a way to uh, describe disengagement from the Middle East, and the Middle East has a way of grabbing you and pulling you back in, uh, as, as, as we have witnessed. So uh, that's why I think that the administration started backtracking from this idea of a, of a pivot because it, it clearly cannot happen um, give, given the way the world is. Uh, I do worry, however, about back to the budget for just a second. What, what that budget entails, just to be simple on, on something, is fewer ships. Well, that's a big deal for Asia where our presence is a key component of reassuring allies and persuading neutrals that uh, we're going to be there, that it's okay to work with the United States in the face of a increasingly ag aggressive expanding China. And, and so numbers of ships in Asia matters, at, and in other parts of the world too. And, 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 and so I, I guess I would have some criticisms of the, of the president on uh, – on, on pivots and so forth and, and, and the perception that the U.S. is in withdrawal mode around the world. But I also believe that the budgets we pass, in addition to the consequences of how much you can buy with that amount of money, also send a signal to the world about the United States more broadly and whether we intend to continue to be engaged or whether the country is in withdrawal mode. And, and, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people, friend, foe, and neutrals are watching uh, at this time as, as they look at the United States. Well, I think you're going to have a lot of people watching your, watching your hearings and your deliberations on this. Let's, uh, let's turn, if we can, to, to you, to the members for your comments and questions. I would um, oblige to say this is on the record, of course. Uh, and... Um, just raise your hand. Or would you do, just please identify yourself by name, your affiliation if you want to, and then uh, please be as concise as you can. Yes, sir. Interested. But, uh, my name is uh, Roland Paul. I, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I've been uh, in the U.S. government twice uh, in national security uh, area. Um, I, I certainly applaud what you've said, Congressman, about uh, the situation with ISIS, and I'm a registered Democrat, <laughs> but um, I wonder if we flesh, flesh it out a little bit more. W what can you say about whether the likelihood or, or the, how the, that your committee might feel about adding uh, uh, forward air controllers or advisors at the battalion level uh, that's, that uh, hasn't been done so far? Yeah, I, I think the administration would argue that that would be permitted under this authorization. Uh, again, the, the, there's, there's two, well, three real conditions on it. One, as I mentioned, is enduring offensive ground combat operations. That is not authorized. There is a time limit of three years. And then there is a definition of who you can go after. Uh, 
ISIS and uh, affiliated forces. Uh, just as a brief side note, the administration does not want to change the 2001 AUMF, which is directed towards Al Qaeda. So you've got, you, you do have Al Qaeda affiliates side by side with ISIS inside Syria, and yet under the administration's proposal, they can do more against the Al Qaeda affiliates than they can do against ISIS, even though they're side by side in the same country. I got some questions about that. Uh, but I think it, it's still a question for the president. Do you put forward ground controllers out there? Do you put intelligence collection collectors out there? If we're training the Iraqi military, do you allow those advisors to go into the field with them, which uh, has been a key factor in success in training efforts in the past? You know, the president would decide whether that is permitted or not. I think all of those things would be permitted under his draft AUMF proposal, but but still doesn't mean automatically that it would happen. Yes, ma'am. Bhakti Merchandani, I work at One William Street, which is a hedge fund. Um, I've read some of your comments talking about how in investing in the military and making military efforts strong and security strong goes well beyond investing in combat capabilities. With the budget con as constrained as it is, and with the president's recent comments about investing in communities to enhance security, what are your thoughts on expanding enterprise funds beyond Tunisia and Egypt to bolster security, government investments and in things like U.S. companies that are focused on cybersecurity, so government investments that would eventually ideally pay back? Do you think that's an attractive use of the funds in this constrained environment? Uh, generally, yes. Uh, so, for example, a, a couple weeks ago, I was in Tunisia, and uh, I, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to help, encourage, reward a country that is uh, a, a Muslim country where the Arab Spring started that just uh, swore in their first democratically elected government. And, 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 and so we ought to look for ways to work with people who are on our side, in part to help allay these concerns that the United States is not a reliable friend or ally. And, and I think we have to be smart about it. And you know, some of the various programs, <coughs> excuse me, we've had over the years <coughs> have, ha may have built resentment as much as strengthened those bonds of friendship. So we need to be smart. Um, you know, personally, I've always been a, a, a fan of the Millennium Challenge account idea where we uh, encourage reforms like legal mm -hmm. reforms that benefit the people in exchange for some of, some of our assistance. Uh, last point I would make is I, I think it, there is a very important role for various kinds of economic and, and non-military assistance for, for a variety of these countries. At the same time, I strongly believe there is no substitute for U.S. M military strength. Uh, we, you know, those programs, the economic and development uh, sorts of programs, are not going to be effective if, if you don't have security. And, and I think some of the writing and thinking on this topic that security has to come first uh, when we look at uh, Iraq and, and Afghanistan, for example, is, is right on the money. That doesn't mean we have to do everything, but the perception of a weakened or withdrawing United States leads uh, other players in to fill the void, and it destabilizes uh, everything and uh, makes it really hard for any of that economic or development help to, to pay dividends. Bert, yeah. uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, my questions are sort of conceptual rather than operational, um, and I, you can answer them in one, but uh, first I have difficulties in the uh, House of Representatives uh, collectively deciding whether you should have forward air controllers or not. Um, it doesn't seem to me that a legislative body is the best place to make decisions of that kind. So I wonder 
if the if the house uh, isn't overreaching in terms of its capabilities. Bert, how about we do one question at a time? No, I completely agree with you, and and I know of no scenario where the house would dictate uh, in legislation there should or should not be forward air controllers. I, I, Back to, I think, uh, where, where we started today, uh, the, the fundamental job of the Congress is to build the military capability. Uh, it is up to the commander in chief on how to use it. Now, it is also fair for us as an independent branch of government to make comments and even criticism if the commander in chief is not using that capability in as smart a way. But it, it, I completely agree that we cannot micromanage the battlefield which is part of the reason I personally have concerns about these conditions on the AUMF, about what's offensive and what's not. Well, it kind of depends, you know, on the circumstances. Uh, so I, I, I think we have to avoid, wh while it's fair to comment, we have to avoid putting in legislation uh, or in law overly restrictive constraints on any president. So I'm, yeah. Sir. D. Smith, um, Strategic Insight Group and Dallas Committee on Foreign Relations. A question on a budgetary matter. In operations other than war, where does the money come from? For example, the U.S. military deployment in West Africa for the Ebola crisis. Was that, did that come out of the defense budget or did it come from some other source? Um, it, it came out of the defense budget. The President asked for, uh, I, I believe, a, a, what we used to call supplementals. Uh, some extra funding to cover the costs of a particular operation or deployment, um, and but it, it gets charged basically against the, the defense budget. And and maybe more detail than you want to know, but there are some people who say that it's okay if we go ahead and fund the military at the lower sequestration level, we'll just make up for it with these supplementals, or what's called OCO, Overseas Contingency Accounts. Um, there's a number of problems with that theory, but that is one of the discussion items going around Washington now, that even if we shortchange it over here, we'll make up for it over here. Yeah, that's, that's a sort of important vocabulary. It's called OCOA, so-called war funding. That's what it's usually referred to in the, in the press, and that's, I think, about $50 billion dollars yeah, it's in 60 the something this year, it's 50 for next year's request. Yeah. And there's, there's, I think, a mistaken assumption that you could just slip stuff into OCOA and it won't get sequestered, but that's not true, right? That's not true, and it's also not true that we can automatically pass an increase in, the, in that budget. As a matter of fact, a couple years ago, we had a combination of Republicans and Democrats vote to significantly reduce that on the House floor. So the idea that you can automatically make up for deficiencies with this war uh, Fund, uh, you know, operational funding is 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 uh, false. I think. Yes, sir. Mr. Lee from People's Daily. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, one or two days ago, I heard that the U.S. will postpone the withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan. Right. Uh, so does it mean that the U.S. Uh, is worrying that the Taliban will? Uh, have a kind of combination with IS, or even if uh, U.S. doesn't think that Taliban is a terrorist group? Um, well, uh, I, I'll set the whether the, the Taliban is a terrorist group aside for just a second. Um, I was in a meeting with the, the new president of Afghanistan a few weeks ago, and he strongly suggested to us that it would be beneficial to him if we did not withdraw our troops from Afghanistan on the pace that the president had announced. Uh, not that there's a particular security worry, but as, as we've seen in Iraq, Afghanistan, and a variety of places, as we try to train and build up security forces, it takes some time. And if you leave too early, uh, then, then you can uh, really leave a problem and 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 so his request is uh, as I understand it is is to 
basically maintain current levels for the rest of this year in Afghanistan to give our folks more time to work with his, gather intelligence and the sorts of things that, that we are helping them with, not in a combat role. And he thinks at the end of that year that he will be in a much better position to protect his own security. And remember, that's the goal. It's to help these folks be able to take care of their own security needs. Um, and, and so I think it makes sense. I, I don't know that a decision has been made. I, I read the, the press reports that you indicate. I think Secretary Carter's been talking about that on his trip there. But it certainly makes sense to me. John. John, may we turn your, turn your mic on, please? Uh, John Biggs, NYU uh, Stern School. <clears throat> I teach a course on risk management, and uh, what you face is beyond anything we can uh, uh, talk to our students about. Uh, so I uh, am impressed. But uh, it seems that we've had a steady withdrawal in budgets from Western European countries over the years, military budgets, relying heavily on big spending from us. Uh, are we making clear to them that the Russian threat uh, can't be entirely financed by increased money coming from the U.S.? Are there, is there any sign that they're stepping up to the plate and providing more money for, uh, uh, for defense? Oh, there's a few little glimmers of hope that some of them are waking up to the challenges that are in their own neighborhood, um, but, but not nearly enough. And I, you know, I, I think that, that the administration makes that point clear. Certainly when we have legislative interactions, uh, you know, for example, at the Munich Security Conference a couple weeks ago, that was made very clear to, to every uh, European country that, that we had the opportunity to meet with. Um, but we need to keep pushing because, you know, they're, they're nowhere near. If, I th well, I think there's only two or three countries that meet the 2% of GDP threshold that NATO has, has, has set. Um, and, and some of them, particularly the wealthier ones, are so far be below that. You just think, good heavens. <coughs> That's a really good question because the whole this whole sort of alliance management issue is was I think one of the top five, it usually is one of the top five issues in the QDR and it's certainly I think going to be an issue as you as you sift through the through the budget proposal. Yes, sir. Uh, Scott Helfstein, Van Y Mellon. Thank you for your comments this morning, Congressman. Uh, from your perspective, militarily, diplomatically, what do you think the next steps with Russia are? Um, I think the next step needs to be to provide the Ukrainians more assistance with which to defend themselves. So the ranking Democrat on our committee, Adam Smith from Washington and I, have jointly introduced legislation that would require defensive lethal assistance be provided to the Ukrainians. And what we're talking about is the sort of things that can stop a tank or an armored car. Uh, secure communications, so the Russians aren't listening to everything they say. Uh, you know, night vision goggles and, and, and so forth. Um, now, the German argument back is, well, if you, we give those sorts of weapons to the Ukrainians, Putin will just increase the ante, and so you'll have escalation and more people will die. I, I guess my answers to that are, number one, any people deserve the right to defend themselves. And for us to make the decision that, oh, they can't win, so we're not going to give them anything or any means with which to defend themselves is pretty arrogant uh, and, and, I think, mistaken on our part. Secondly, I'm of the view that uh, Putin will continue to push forward until he, has, he meets some resistance or pays some price. And, and if you're in the Baltics or in other Eastern European sort of countries, you're watching this very closely. Now, I can't, you know, tell you that if we give certain things to Ukrainians, Putin will back off. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that he's denying that he even has Russian troops in Ukraine. You know, it, it, it's for who? Me? I don't know anything about it. These are just patriotic uh, Ukrainians who are rising up against their evil government. There has to be some increased price that, that he pays, and, and, and I think uh, the Ukrainians are willing to, to take some of that on. Uh, so I think that's the next step. And, 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 and then after that, I think a reassurance mission 
for other countries in the Baltics and Eastern European is important, whether it's, it's and, and we do some rotational things there now, but uh, a greater presence of NATO and especially the United States would, would be beneficial. Did, uh, will your bill pass? And what do you think this administration will do um, with your offer to? Yeah, I, I don't know what they'll do. I think it would have overwhelming bipartisan support. As, as I've talked with Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate, there is, uh, there is very little resistance to the idea that we should uh, provide these sorts of, of uh, equipment and weapons to the Ukrainians. So I think it would pass overwhelmingly. Uh, I don't know what the administration would do. Uh, they say they're still looking at it and studying it, but uh, meanwhile, Putin pushes up, presses on. Yes, sir. Gentleman with a potted tie. Steve Rodriguez, I work in venture capital here in New York, and uh, I uh, actually heard your remarks at the Reagan uh, National Security Forum, I think that's what it was called, yeah. uh, which were very good. Um, given that the part of the topic, at least today, is uh, defense reform, um, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Obviously, we have uh, Secretary Kendall work and now uh, Carter in place. Given that they have two years, roughly, give or take, actually less uh, in office, and they have a number of top-down initiatives that they're currently pushing, uh, that, that being from OSD uh, itself. What's your expectation in terms of the efficacy of their, their abilities to reform uh, their own institution? I'm, I'm of the view that we have a unique opportunity right now uh, with Under Secretary Kendall and, and what he has started and, and his willingness to work with us, with Secretary Carter and his background in these areas, uh, Senator McCain chairing the Senate committee and, and our House committee is gonna make a major push on this. So I think we have a unique opportunity uh, to make some of the changes that need to be made in the way the, the, the Pentagon operates. Uh, I don't think we need to try to solve everything in a, in a two-year period or in a single bound. Usually 2,000-page bills that try to fix all the problems don't work out very well. Um, but I think we can make a start. So, for example, uh, Secretary Kendall has sent over to us a series of legislative proposals to simplify and thin out laws and regulations. Uh, and, and we are going to take a really hard look at, at what he has asked us to do and, and maybe add some to it and, and get, get, get his views on that. So I think there's a real opportunity for progress here. The most uh, frequent reaction I get is eye rolling. Yeah, you know, people saying, oh, we've heard that before. What makes you think you can really, really do that? Well, I think that's not an excuse not to make an effort. I think we need to first be like the physicians and do no harm. In other words, what Congress often has done in the past is add new layers of oversight or bureaucracy, and, and we don't want to do that. We want to thin it down to simplify it so there can be accountability for the decisions that are made. Part of the problem now is if a program goes seriously off track, it's hard to know who to hold accountable because so many people have a piece of the decision-making process. If we can simplify it, increase accountability, um, I, I think it, it, it will be significant steps in the right direction. Last point I make is the Pentagon spends more money procuring services than it does weapons and equipment. And, and, and part of what we need to do in Congress is have better oversight of that because we tend to gravitate to the bright, shiny ob objects, you know, the, the planes and the ships. And, and, and this other stuff that's kind of more nebulous and, and not quite as sexy, we tend to not even pay much attention to. So uh, this is not just about Pentagon laws and regulations. This is also about how we conduct oversight, the questions we ask. Uh, and, and so we're going to try to improve in, in the number of reports we require. We're going to try to improve our end of this process, too. And as, at least as long as I'm in this job, we're going to keep working each year to try to make it better. Which of the hard proposals for reform are you likely to encourage the most? Well, anytime the most important element of our defense, uh, of our country's defense, are our people. And so anytime you start uh, uh, 
reforming programs that deal with people, then it is subject to a lot of questions and pushback, uh, but it all, you also want to be sure you understand the unintended consequences. Because if we do something dumb and are not able to continue to attract and retain the top quality people we need, then we will have, have, uh, have, have crippled the defenses of the United States in a way that takes years to recover from. Uh, so, uh, I, I will see uh, what we are able to do of the recommendations that this personnel commission has given us. Some of them involve health care, and everybody here knows how complicated it is to try to reform health care. Um, some of them involve a different retirement system for new people coming in. In other words, you keep, we keep our commitments to the people who are already in the military, but for the people signing up, they have more of a 401k defined contribution plan rather than a, a defined benefit plan that you only get after 20 years, by the way. So 83% of the people who serve in the military get no retirement whatsoever because they don't last the 20 years. Maybe that's not the smartest uh, way to compete with Google for cyber talent in, in the future. Uh, so, 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 <laughs> you know, that, that's some of, uh, but I think the people is the most critical, mm -hmm. critical area. Yes, sir. This is a, a Bruce Gelb, Chairman of the Council of American Ambassadors. This is, a, I think, a relatively simple question, but for me, a very complicated one. What I keep seeing in the articles that I read is that our president, who has one of the lowest ratings among the American people in terms of confidence in his behavior and actions that we've had in a long, long time, the impression I have is that he can do what he damn well pleases if he wants to do anything on any one of these fronts that you're talking about without the, the authorization of the, the Congress or anyone else. Is that a fact? You're right, it's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> he, he is, uh, and I'm sure we don't want to get into a variety of other issues where the president has broken new ground in deciding what laws he chooses to enforce and what laws he chooses to change. Um, but it is, as I mentioned a while ago, we have been bombing in Iraq and Syria since August, September, and uh, only now and, and, and for the last six months, he has argued, I don't need an authorization, more authorization to do this. Everything I'm doing is covered under the 2001 authorization. Uh, and then, back to the why now question, all of a sudden it, it comes up and says, okay, I really want you all to, to authorize this. Um, I don't know. I can't make sense of all that from a constitutional standpoint. But what does weigh on me, as I mentioned, is if we're gonna send men and women out to perform dangerous missions, they deserve to have the full protection of the Constitution, and they deserve to know that the country's government and thus the country's people support what they're doing. I think we owe it to them, uh, even if we cannot understand how the president views his uh, authority or if he thinks there's any restrictions on his authority. I still think we owe it to those people out on the front lines. Yes, sir. It's Bob Katz from Goldman Sachs. I'm curious how you would score congressional oversight in the armed services area over your time on the committees. Uh, the impression from outside is that domestic programs receive kind of granular oversight of the quality and effectiveness, and that at the military side, it's all about a, a dollar number and the experts inside kind of tell Congress and, and us uh, or decide what they need to do when you either fund it or not. But over the time you've been there, has the quality, uh, granularity, or however you wanted to describe it, of oversight changed? Um, I, th I think it's varied. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's been up and down. There have been times when it was only because of congressional oversight and advocacy 
that, for example, Up Armor Hub Vs were, were brought into Iraq uh, to make a real difference in saving lives of, of our folks. So we made a real difference on something that, uh, that was really important at the, at the time. Uh, I mentioned, I think we largely, we don't pay as much attention to uh, the, the, a lot of the, 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 the less than sexy elements of the department budget, like contracting for services and, and other things. Uh, now, th you know, this might be an opportune time if I wanted to, to uh, whine about our committee budget. You know, we've got like 50 people who oversee, um, uh, you know, 500 to 600 billion dollars. Uh, uh, well, no, I, I, you know, but, but, uh, but, but, but it, here's, I, I, have, I have this uh, view. I, I think there are some people in the Pentagon who like us to get embroiled down in the weeds on kind of some of the, the smaller issues that, that may be important to somebody. But if, if you're down in the weeds all the time, it's pretty hard to look up and see the bigger picture. And what the Constitution puts on our shoulders is this broader picture. So it's important to be able to dig down on particular systems uh, and, and understand what's happening. But it is even more important for us to kind of have this, this bigger picture of where we're headed. What are the, th one, of, one of the story that's stuck in my mind is uh, when, when Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense, after we won the first Persian Gulf War, the first call he made was to President Reagan to thank him for the defense items that were purchased and, and acquired during the Reagan years, because that's what they had to fight the, the first Gulf War with. So part of our job in Congress is to make the decisions in building the force that the next president and the next president will have available to him or her to, to, to defend the country. And, and I think it's really important for us to, to keep in mind that bigger, longer view. And if I had to give us a grade on how well we've done that over the years, it's pretty poor. We get, we get down into the weeds too much and, and fail to have that broader and longer view. And so I hope that we can improve that. Yeah, it is true that risk management has a forward temporal component to it that uh, we, we ignore at our peril. Questions? Bert, you have another bite at the apple, but a question, please. When um, uh, Mr. Gates was Secretary of Defense, spent his life in CIA, um, at one point he remarked that he has more uh, musicians on the payroll than the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State has uh, trained negotiators to settle things, and his successor said, I've got more lawyers in the Defense Department then the Secretary of State has to negotiate conclusions to these problems which we are bombing. Um, you prepared to s say on the record you'd like to see 10% of the defense budget be transferred to the S State Department so that we can settle some of these problems which we're just bombing? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I spent a year at the State Department. Uh, I appreciate what they do, but going back to the, the, the conversation we had a few minutes ago, um, diplomacy is not going to work without a strong, credible U.S. military. Uh, now, I am willing to cut 10, maybe 20 percent off of the uh, bureaucratic overstructure in the Pentagon. And one of our reform efforts it will be to try to reduce overhead, not just at the Pentagon, but at some of the combatant commands as well. A fair number of people coming out of even the Obama administration are saying it has grown way too big, it's way too cumbersome, and slows down decision making because of all of those layers. So back to my point about simplifying and thinning out, uh, partly to save money, partly to help the Pentagon be more agile in, in making decisions, I think that is a very good priority. Um, and, and it is certainly something we want to pursue. And I think the State Department ought to be adequately funded. Uh, we just have, uh, for the, we remember who we sent to deal with Obola, it, it was the military. 
So they're the ones that we send to deal with problems that, uh, that come up. State Department does not have a capability to go deal with that or a variety of other things. Well, thank you very much. One of the rules is we end on time, and uh, I know you're headed for a train back, back from Ice Station Zebra to Washington, D.C., also locked in snow and ice. So please join me in thanking the chairman.